Um, I've known Larry Arn for uh, a quarter of a century now. Uh, I, was, I served on the board of his uh, Claremont Institute out in California. And about 20 years ago, he came to me and said, this Hillsdale College place has offered me its presidency. And using my wise counsel, I said, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you're running your own institute here. What you say goes, and you're going to work with faculty and administration and these wild kids here, you know. Uh, happily, he ignored my sage advice. Uh, and it's one of the best things that ever happened to this institution. I do think that... Uh, I do think when the complete history of Hillsdale is written one day, I think the years of Larry Arndt's tenure with the leadership of Bill Broadbeck and the board will be looked at as the golden years of Hillsdale. Uh, it has been a privilege to be with him. He's a great man in large part because his partner is a great woman, the lovely Penny. And yeah, he's a great man, but for Leslie and me, uh, more importantly, he's a great friend. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Larry Arn. Good evening. I am a partner with Penny. I'm the junior partner. <laughs> Pat is one of my oldest friends. And uh, he's so faithful and consistent and calm and possessed of good judgment. And I'm grateful to him. Uh, I thank uh, Victor and Mark and Molly, who in their each separate ways are forces of nature and among the most important people in the world. I single out Nancy Johnson to thank, who's the head of our capital campaign. Where's she? Where's Nancy? Yeah, yeah, stand up. I came here just about 20 years ago, and there were three people working in my office one of them, Nancy, and two of them, including Nancy, fled in terror within two months. <laughs> she went to a more sane place, working for John Cervini. But I've never known her not to do a thing well, nor for that matter, John Cervini or Rich Payway, who managed the construction of the chapel, and uh, I, my colleagues, I, uh, you know what I think, but uh, I love you. I say that in part because I've been cranky this afternoon because uh, some of you couldn't hear. And I made the point to somebody, oh, it was so wonderful. And I said, you know, in modern times, we will never get a better opportunity to explain the meaning of Hillsdale College than this morning. And about 60% of the people couldn't hear very well. And you know, at Hillsdale College, we're not in prisoner taking business. You know, we're cocky, right? We think we're the best, and we think that's not good enough. So I apologize to you, and uh, if you want to hear, I, I also noticed a funny thing, and that is, it was the people who sat in the places where they couldn't hear very well who were the most complimentary about what I had to say. <laughs> what are we to make of that? Um, but you can get a tape of that if you want to see it. And, you know, Justice Thomas was there, and the choir was gorgeous, and the building is, you know, not bad. So the last time I talked about the past, what the college is for, and uh, tonight I'm going to talk not too long about the future. 
It's uh, easy to predict the future in one way. The college stands for some things that it claims are eternal. Let's just say as long as nature lasts. So is there a time conceivable when we won't need to have a good character? What is a good character? It's a... Uh, we're these strange creatures, right? We have these bodies. They have these needs. They hurt, and they feel pleasure. And the first the primary virtues concern dealing with those. Do you want to be a coward? Do you want to be a dissolute? Do you think you can mount to anything at all if you're either of those things? Or any of the other moral virtues which lead up toward justice? So as long as there are people, there will need to be character. And all of these things, by the way, I'm going to comment, it's shocking that we don't teach these things because they are, in fact, the most obvious things in the world. Is there going to be a time when we don't need to learn? What is the thing about us? We're the only ones, right? I. Uh, I have a favorite translator, although he's idiosyncratic, and the way he translates the first sentence of Aristotle's meta metaphysics is, the human soul stretches itself out to know. Don't you see that in yourselves constantly? Don't, don't you every day meet, meet something that Aristotle always calls an impasse, an aporia, and that is, you see two things and they don't make sense together. And that is an opportunity for thinking. And it's how we figure out the world. And we love to do that. Indeed, much of our sense of our value of ourselves is that we can make some sense of the world. Learning, <laughs> always. Freedom, if there's a choosing being, if, uh, you know, we have, you, you, you've, if, most of you saw my dogs, right? our dogs, right? Actually, they're, if, if there's reincarnation, and there isn't, <laughs> then you want to come back as one of my wife's dogs. <laughs> and, you know, the most troublesome one is my dog, but she takes care of it. It's the nature of our marriage. And... They don't choose. Now, they select or opt all the time. You know, they know when to beg, and I indulge them. But, you know, we, here's the thing about us. We can do a thing and commit ourselves to action and then wonder for days or years, was it the right thing? Something stands outside our actual actions and judges whether they were right or not. And given the capacity for that, then it's nature. We ought to get to exercise it. We need freedom. And of course, because we're made to talk and therefore we're made to live together under law, we need laws that protect our freedom. And as long as there are people, we're gonna need those things. God, what do you want to know? More than anything, what do you want to know? You have these moments. I talked about it today, but none of you heard it. <laughs> um, don't you have these moments when you're taken quite away from yourself? Even in the middle of urgent things that are bothering you or you're, are compelling you, and you stop and you go, Something occurs to you, right? Something high. Something that calls. Like the chaffin. Do you see things and you think some are better than others? What does it mean, better? Can't that only be judged in relation to something perfect? Don't you want to complete the story? when you start making a hierarchy of things which we can't stop doing. You know, I happen to be a boy, and so 
we boys, girls are uh, better civilized than we are, in my experience. They, uh, we boys, we like, if they're sports teams, right, we want to know, like, who's better, the 1927 Yankees or the 1962 Green Bay Packers? <laughs> And they will never meet, of course, <laughs> and, you know, but we just love things like that, right? Why? Because we want to know what the best is. And when we rank things, we find things in them that seem more f perfect than other things. And that means we're always trying to go up. Those are the purposes of Hillsdale College, and the claim is that they're eternal meaning at least as long as there is their nature. So we know if they're right. By the way, if they're wrong, these 175 years mean nothing whatsoever. If they're not true, every one of them today, then they were never true. If the Declaration of Independence, you know, John Dewey and Woodrow Wilson and those guys, they're always writing that it's somewhat outmoded, right? And the, but they say, really good for its time. And that's an impossible argument, because what it claims is that it's good be, for beyond time. And that means if it isn't true now, it wasn't true then. And if it was true then, then it must be true now. And so the college actually exists to invite us to face those facts. And that's eternal. That can't change. What can change? Everything else. Do you think that tyranny might be coming? I do. I, I don't, I, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I think it's open. Look at it, right? What, where's it evident, right? I, uh, Justice Thomas was arrested by my claim that, uh, and you know, Justice Thomas, I can just tell you something about him. He's a student. He's just, you know, in colleges, see, I, late in my life, I was 45 years old or so, I started working in a college. I'd avoided it like the plague before. And uh, this happens to be a good one, right? So I work here and like it. But what do you learn, right? You learn that it's in the student. And people who are students by nature, they get better all the time. Justice Thomas is like that. And that means you never say a thing around him that he doesn't note it down and ask you about it later. And so today he's asking me, who is the student of Hegel with whom John C. Calhoun studied at Yale College? Because I think, and I'm not speaking for him, and I would not do that because he's the greatest man I know and greater than I, I think it might mean that he's connecting things that friends of mine have connected for some time now. And that is this here right-wing confederacy and this here modern left-wing progressivism, they might be akin. Or as Churchill point the point, put the point, the Nazis and the communists they do differ just exactly as the North Pole differs from the South. Look at them, they're the same. Well, he wanted, so I have to go look all that up and prove it, you know, and if I don't, I'll be ashamed. And, uh, and uh, but I, I can. Because I, you know, just in the last couple of years, I verified it. Because I'd heard it years ago and I started saying it again, everybody said, really? That's what that's about, see? And I, I can tell you in simple terms what it's about. We live in the age of modern science, and modern science is different from ancient science. Science is a Latin word that just means to know. Ancient science is just to see, to behold, to love the things that are higher, to do it systematically, true enough. But if your idea is rather, I'm gonna study it and test, and show how to change everything the way I please. Bacon says, torturing nature. 
That was born even before German philosophy. But in the 19th century, these German philosophers, right, they came to understand what they regarded as a great opportunity. And you know, philosophers are very wise people more than we are, and so it's one's reluctant to talk about their errors, and yet there's no choice, because you have to choose between them. They, thought, they saw a thing that they thought might be disastrous, but really mostly was very hopeful, and that is everything is change, and we are all victims and shaped by that change. But now we know that. We're the first ones to know that. And that changes everything. Now we could become the masters of the process of change. We could become our own creators. And then at last, we would be free. Now, the free definition of freedom I gave earlier is God gave us volition. The implication is we should use it. And that's very simple. That's an argument in Aristotle, right? Do you ever see uh, sled dogs running? Isn't it a delightful sight? And they're made for that, right? Now, imagine, imagine horses doing it. They wouldn't be very good at that. They're too long-legged, you know, right? And so they're made for that. And Aristotle says, well, if you can see that and see they're made for that, can you see what a human being is made for? And we all know what they're made for. We see excellent ones, and we all admire them. Almost all the same, by the way. I mean, leaving out of account Bernie Sanders. <laughs> and see, this idea that we can remake everything, because now we know everything has changed, and we are dominated by the influences that come through change. What if we could control all those influences? Do you begin to see why the government would like to control every single thing? Why it's of concern to them what we say in this room tonight? Why they're not impressed with the fact that fools though we are, we have the right to say it. They're thinking, they can't say that. They can't say that, see. We will stop that. That's the temper that grows up, and it came into America, as it came into Germany before, through some very elite thinkers, the best, right? And it came to an America, and it spread, because it's a very powerful argument. It's easier to see today, because we live amidst the bureaucratic age, and we can see that that's dangerous and arbitrary, or the way we here can, many people can't see that. But back then, it was pure hope, right? Because we could set everything right. And even those great ones, they didn't think enough about the meaning of that term, right. Because if everything is changed, by what standard do you know if a thing is right? And what's happened in the country since that was born? First of all, it has known nothing but progress anywhere in the world. Reagan interrupted it a little bit in this country for a while. Trump is fighting against it. You know, maybe artfully, maybe not. You know, it depends on what you think about that. But there can't really be much doubt that he's fighting it. Oh, I have an email today from the regulatory czar. <laughs> I get my updates every day now. And uh, he says next Wednesday, something's going to happen. Could I be in Washington? So you guys are all here. I don't have to think about that. But tomorrow, I'm going to figure out if I can go to Washington on Wednesday. And I got no idea what's going to happen. But whatever it is, I want to see it. <laughs> you should watch the news. Remember, little nerdy guy, Paul Ray. This has never been set back. What's it done? Uh, just think of one thing, right? It is the most important thing for the long term, although it's not the most important thing on any given day. Think of education. Do you know how that's been remade? I mean, it is complete and thorough. So 
you know, John Dewey at Columbia and, and uh, Woodrow Wilson at Princeton and a few other places like that, they start going from place to place to place. And their, 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 their uh, apostleship, their uh, gospel is, we can set everything right. Nothing should be in our way. We can make it all fine, right? Never mind what the word fine might be. Don't want to, ma don't want to spend too much time on that. And then the next thing you know, it spread everywhere. And it remakes the face of the modern university. You know, there used to not be departments. Uh, I see, because uh, he's so tall, I see Kaltoff over there, right? And I saw Whalen somewhere before. How many years have we been talking about how we could get rid of all the departments at Hillsdale College? And we haven't got rid of them yet, but CORE is the big deal now, see? Because why? The departments are places of specialized knowledge for the remaking of society. And that's what John Dewey announces in the document that founded the Teachers Union for Colleges, on whose blacklist we are honored to be. <laughs> and that means that there isn't any common sense way to think about what's right and wrong. There's only testing. And so one of the things that when they departmentalized the university, one of the things they founded was the education department. And if you think about that for a minute, isn't that odd that in an institution of higher education, there would be one department called education? <laughs> it's actually kind of stupid. And, 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 but what do they teach, right? We have an education department here, but we don't have an education major. And the reason is the people in our department are really smart. Is Copeland here tonight? He's been hanging around a lot. I don't know. Um, he, he's the chairman, Dan Copeland. Anyway, they, they, they don't study stuff anymore. They study how to deliver stuff. Understanding that the stuff that's delivered will be defined by some central place and so teachers are now delivery boys. You know, my father, a uh, high school teacher in Arkansas, Hillary Clinton, you know, because there's a pattern, right? Bill gets elected governor. The biggest thing is education. She gets control of that. Same thing, health care in America. And, uh, and he just, just rail about that. What are they doing, right? Our school, where I've worked all my life, they think they can run it better in Little Rock than we can run it here. And they never meet the students, right? I used to hear that from him. And I would say, oh, Dad, you're just annoyed at them because they're the local thing and they're typical of the bad things. And he said, no, they're worse than that. And you know, my life is a process of understanding my dad was right. He was right about that, too. <laughs> so now, what is it? Now, uh, I think it was my daughter Alice, one of the daughters said to me that they were watching a movie with some friends and that some of the people were not such good friends. Anyway, there was a dinner and the women got up and retired to another room. And some of the girls thought that they were, they had rooms where they were incarcerated except where the men left them out. That's what Victoria times were. And I said, goodness gracious, did they never meet, read Jan Austen? It wasn't like that. Well, they think it was like that. And they think that, you know, do you know the New York Times thing that's going on right now, 169 Project, is that what it is? America was founded on the day that the first slave ship arrived. Okay, fine, but did it arrive in America? Because it must have been earlier, except actually it was much later with a document that says all men are created equal. So they control what we know. And that's comprehensive and it's everything else too. You never know when you'll hear from them and you never know what they'll say. This kind of government has to be hostile to anything that's independent. 
my son-in-law, Dan, sitting over there. Uh, Dan, stand up. Uh, and uh, where's my daughter? Because she's off somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. And you, you saw her today. You may wonder why she married Dan. We don't know. <laughs> anyway, was, I was making the argument. And, it, you know, did you know that Winston Churchill is a very great man? I mean, really. I'm, I, I'll be working on Churchill. I still do all the time. And uh, we'll be in bed, and I'll be, Penny and I both take our computers to bed. It's not an entirely unromantic thing. We have four children. But, uh, but, uh, I'll be working away, and I'll say to myself, Winston Churchill was a very great man. And she'll say, uh, you've said that, dear. <laughs> It's from him and from Aristotle, but first from Churchill, I learned that statesmanship is presented as the guardianship of wisdom. Because you know, people who are wise, they get that way because they don't go about urgent politics every day. And yet, they're not necessarily practical people. And somebody is, gonna, is going to oppress them unless somebody protects them. Here's Winston Churchill talking about Hitler, about who his enemies are. Venerable pastors, upright magistrates, world-class scientists and philosophers, independent-minded, manly citizens, frail, poor old women of unfashionable opinion are, are uh, invaded, bullied, and brutalized by g gangs of armed hooligans. Why would they do that? The answer is this passion for controlling everything will brook nothing independent. It thinks, it claims, it can perfect everything. If only it can get the power to control everything. And since the scientific experiment is the methodology, it means nothing can be outside that experiment. I teach a course here, and we read totalitarian novels. Uh, I, there's about seven of them that we've read various times, right? But if you read Darkness at Noon in 1984, you see the spirit of it. And most of these totalitarian novels, not all, are written by people who saw this firsthand, indeed were complicit in it. George Orwell waited in a cell for three nights in Spain for them to come get him and shoot him. And he was a communist revolutionary in the Spanish Civil War. Arthur Kersler was an important, Darkness at Noon, he wrote, Arthur Kersler was an important functionary of the Communist Party in Hungary. And he, too, woke up in fear of his life. And they thought, that set him thinking, you know, really? What have I done? It's horrific. And it's driven, made more horrific by the fact that it's driven by something good, which is the wish to ameliorate the difficulties of human life, which turns into the, the wish to eliminate them all. Do you see what it's like to raise young children in this age? I mean, young children, 18 to 21-year-olds. That's our specialty. They're really great. They're almost human. <laughs> and they grow up in a world where they, you know, it, at least in the public discourse, they haven't been told anything, except that they can be whatever they want to be. And we don't get that much, because this is a really weird place, and it's hard to get into. And, the kids who get in here have learned a lot about it. But once in a while, they'll say, well, you know, I just want to become whatever I could be. And I always say, good, you should be an aardvark. <laughs> <laughs> or would you rather be a human? Because we know what that's like, and we know what the good ones are like. We take that away from them. This is a massive and dangerous force. It may overcome us. 
I said uh, two days ago, I said, you know, this is like the great crises. The Revolutionary War, that was a fight about who is entitled to govern, which is a fight always when it comes up about what is the human being. And the Civil War was exactly the same thing. Isn't this just like it? Is, it? is it true that each of us in his common sense has a right to govern his own life, which is what God gave him, according to a moral and rational sense that only we among creatures have? Or is it true that only people who are experts and scientists can really pick our way? There's this uh, guy named Douglas Jay and he made the mistake in the first socialist government in Britain, which beat Winston Churchill. He made the mistake of saying in, Churchill, in the House of Commons, in Churchill's hearing, he said, uh, mothers don't always know what is best for their children. The gentlemen of Whitehall know better. Whitehall is the governing center. And you know, it was just such a mistake to say that with Winston <laughs> Churchill in the room, because Winston Churchill has made him famous to this day for saying that. You know, that's the spirit, though. And so my last point is, what do we do about it? First of all, it's overwhelming, right? Everybody, everybody fancy, everybody elite. All these fancy graduate schools and medical schools and law schools that our kids go to, everybody at those schools disagrees with us. Sometimes I think our kids, our kids are admitted because they're really smart, and you know, they're impressive. But sometimes I think they're admitted because of curiosity. <laughs> One young man who went to Yale Law School, clerk for Clarence Thomas later, a really super young man, important man now, he, uh, he, he, it, wasn't, it wasn't really a slur, but at Yale it was said to him, you're just a uh, white boy from Hillsdale College, you're out of your depth here. Now, I, I, and I, I don't actually mean to criticize the man. Uh, this young man later found out that this guy was on the admissions commission committee that let him in. Why did he let him in? He was curious. What kind of the people are those people? Right? And so now we're studied like specimens. <laughs> so if that's overwhelming, how can we do anything about it? Well, I'll just tell you briefly what we're going to do. I mean, God granting, of course. Because, you know, I want you to know, uh, marvelous things have happened here. And we don't know how. We just got up every day and thought we knew what to do. And we just got about it. And we got about it together. Every day. Day after day after day. And you know, that's a pretty good way to work. But we're not deluded that we're responsible for all this. But if great things have happened, maybe you should try to extend them. We're going to do two things. One is this little place, with its graduate schools. You know, it's growing. We're kind of frightened by that. It's going to be the most intense atmosphere of learning on the face of the earth. It's already like that. You know, coming here, that's like joining the Marines. Say goodbye to your 3.92 high school grade point average. <laughs> this is serious now. You know, I had a girl, uh, Steve Smith. Is he here tonight? He might be. Steve Smith and I have an honor. We uh, once gave an A minus to a girl who only got those two grades in her entire life from kindergarten other than A's. And she cried in my office. And she said, what can I do? And I said, well, you should probably try to do better. <laughs> and she was, you know, she was sobbing. She was later our valedictorian, by the way. And she was sobbing and she says, is there any chance I can get an A? And I said, no, <laughs> get over it. That's the wrong thing to think about, right? Well, the point is, that's the ticket. You want to help them, you want to love them, you want to nurture them, they got to work. They must not pretend to achievements that they have not made. 
Now, when they fall, you got to help them up. And they do fall, you know. And uh, they don't bring me in when they fall because they're afraid I might kick them. <laughs> but, uh, but I won't, right? And this has got to be tireless and relentless and no compromises. See? And I will tell you, everybody I work with and everybody on the board that Pat leads and Bill did breathe, lead, that's what they think. They don't expect us to quit. But then what do we do? Because this can get better than it is, and it's going to. I mean, God granting. That's what I call the nuclear reactor. The general counsel, Bob Norton, doesn't like me to say that it's going to radiate the country because he thinks there might be some liability in that. <laughs> I will say instead that it's going to inspire something in the country. And the means are laid out now. We have uh, founded more than 20, oh, well, in Primus. It was 900,000 when I came here. It's soon to cross 5.5 million. Isn't that? And let that stand for the long list of incredibly stupid things that we do here. Because that thing cost a fortune. And you get it, right? We don't ask for money in that thing. And people send it anyway. I don't get it. It's really great. And you know how many people we talk to in a typical month now? 15 to 20 million. Counting the radio, all that. And it means the college has been famous can become famous, right? Which means it's dangerous, because bad people know who we are, too. Enemies, I mean. We're going to keep that up and grow more. And then we always tried, I, you know, I figured this out a long time ago, because I have this weird history. I've worked in nonprofits all my life. And I didn't, never intended to, but I did. And I figured out something about them. The thing that they make that's the most difficult thing that they make, they don't actually give to the people who provide the money. It's a triangle. So General Motors, they make cars, right? And they sell it to a person and they use the car and they give General Motors money. That's a fairly simple transaction. But, you know, I'm looking around for some students here. There are some here somewhere. Maybe they've gone to bed. <laughs> Probably not. Um, you know, you don't know them. And we just lavish resources on them and attention on them constantly, right? You don't get to see that. And yet, you're paying for it. So how do you make that work? Well, I decided a long time ago, you have to do what you do best for everybody. And so we have two things that now reach very large audiences that are like that. Well. Forget the events like this, you know, somewhere between 15 and 20,000 people a year come to Hillsdale College events. And we never sell tickets. That too is really stupid. <laughs> but we have these 20 plus charter schools now. And you know, that's just a hell of a mess. And Lord, if Waylon and Bill Brobeck haven't hired my daughter to try to fix it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and she will. And, uh, you know, it's great, and there are problems. And we're going to sort the problems out. And they're going to become, I can tell you what they're going to do. They're going to become the greatest collaborative effort for school reform in the United States. <laughs> they're just like everything else. Some of the people who run them are superb, and some of them are not as superb. Some of the teachers just knock the cover off the ball, and others not. It's going to become a great engine so that the best ones help everybody else. And if you don't want to get help, arrivederci. <laughs> we have these uh, online courses. And these two things are two huge academic outreach programs. And they're both one run, uh, one, uh, run by Children of Mine, one of them, Katie, but the other, Kyle, 
who, as I said the other day, I've raised from a pup. He's a student of Hillsdale College. And you know, he's awesome. I mean, he's not here, right? And, uh, and so he's almost finished with his PhD. He didn't want to get it. I made him do it. And what? There are 2.2 million people taking those. But they're getting better all the time. They're going to be an enormous engine for teaching to millions more than now. So finally, when they're elaborated, there will be two things true about it. One is, if you would like to get a liberal education in the second best way, the best way in seminars with people who really know and other people who are giving their hearts to learning, the second best way, take these courses and read these books and watch them over and over and, sp and make that the activity of your life outside your work. You can get a liberal education that way. And here, it's free. And it's going to cover everything. And there are millions doing it, right? And there will be, we pray, a million more. But then, take all that stuff that we learn in the Barney Project. And in K through 12, it's just like college. There isn't any reason not to have classrooms. We can afford it. In fact, we're wasting masses. Did you know that more than half the employees of the public schools are not school teachers? Which means half the budget shamed off and goes somewhere else. We can we cannot just afford it. We can double afford it. But if you're not going to do that because the schools are so bad, homeschoolers and private schools and any school that want everything we get great in the Barney Project, we're going to digitize it and make videos about it and put it online. We've come to think of the college as a different kind of thing. It's a combination of two things that have not been combined as far as we know. One of them is it intends to be the best college. It's not going to stop. We get up in the morning every day saying, not good enough yet. It wouldn't get better if you didn't do that, by the way. But the second thing is it's going to be a means of learning for millions and millions of people. And it's going to radiate that everywhere. And I'll tell you why that's important. There are two reasons. One of them is that's a very beautiful thing. And everybody should see a beautiful thing. Because then they will know what God is like. Also, they will understand their own freedom and why it is not to be interrupted. And the second reason is because we live in an age of confusion that has become dangerous, threatening tyranny, the only thing ultimately that can dispel it is understanding. This college was born 175 years ago to give that understanding not just here, even back then, wherever anybody wanted to learn. You and God have given us the means to make that big. And we're going to save the world. Thank you.